Welcome to Healing Body and Soul, the power of earth and spirit in healing the body. My name is Dr. Judith Boyce, and I'm a naturopathic physician, licensed acupuncturist, and fellow of the American Board of Naturopathic Oncology. I'm also the author of 10 books. The most recent is Soul Medicine, a physician's reflections on life, love, death, and healing. I'm so delighted that you're here today to improve your own health and vitality, to explore the relationship between your inner world and your physical health, and also to explore the relationship between your individual health and the Earth's health. And today, it's my pleasure, my honor to introduce to you Reverend Bodhi B. I'm going to read his bio and say just a tiny bit more, and then we'll be diving into the wisdom that, that Bodhi B has to offer us. Reverend Bodhi B is an ordained interfaith minister and teacher in a Sufi lineage, the executive director of Doorway into Light, a nonprofit organization on Maui. Bodhi is an independent funeral director, end of, end of life and bereavement counselor, hospice volunteer, teacher and trainer of death midwifery, speaker and workshop leader in the fields of wholehearted and sacred living and dying, and a ceremonial guide. Bodhi hosts a weekly radio show, Death Tracks, that streams online. Bodhi is the founder and president of Doorway into Light, the Death Store, and together with his life, wife, children, and grandchildren are off-the-grid organic homesteaders on Maui. I'm envious. <laughs> and, um, I also want to say now that um, Reverend Bodhi B has been instrumental in creating really profound programs for people to begin the process of exploring their own death, which in turn makes our life even more vital. And I know that you'll be saying more about that. And I'm so honored and delighted that you're here with us today. Thank you. So today we're going to be talking about showing up for death, nourishing life. And I'm wondering, um, Reverend Bodhi, if you can say some about Given all that's happening in the world, all the changes that are happening in the world today, what are we being called to do? What are we being asked to do? Well, given that uh, we're seeing things changing so quickly and the nature of life really is change and we're mostly poorly trained in adapting to change, I think there's a lot of low-level anxiety, at least low-level uh, concerning about what's coming or what may be coming. And first of all, I think it's essential that we honor and acknowledge that low-level anxiety and bring it out of the shadows so we're talking about it. And rather than carrying on as if everything will be fine uh, in that, in that uh, hypnotic sleepwalking state, state so many of us spend our time in and then to really look deeply at the um, impermanence of it all because it points to the truth that we're going to die and we don't know when and uh, the world itself may be dying and um, it's too easy to turn away from that big of a piece of information and most people do and we're in a culture here that totally supports us in aversion, denial, avoidance, and distraction. So we, it's up to us and hopefully our community to not um, turn away and also to not give up, but to at least acknowledge that sense of what's the point. And um, in fact, I see so many young people that are, are really lost and hopeless and don't see any point and take on behaviors uh, out of that, that belief. Uh, so then to look at it um, and, and be able to feel what that feels like, because we don't really know we're going to die. It's not really true that we know that. Uh, you can ask anybody, and of course, everybody says, well, of course, uh, we know we're going to die and we don't know when. Of course, we know that people in our lives are going to die and we don't know when. But the truth is that for most people to look at how they live each day of their lives, they don't act like, and I don't always act like, I know I'm going to die and I don't know when. And my children are going to die and I don't know when. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, it's the, uh, the opposite of turning away is to fully embrace uh, the nature of change 
the nature of how precious this life and how fragile it is. And, and that's true for what's happening on our political landscape, as well as on, in what's happening to all of the beings and creatures uh, of this planet, all of nature. Um, that's the short answer. Right. And I'm, I'm wondering, what is it in your life that helped bring you face to face with death? This is an extraordinary body of work to actually consciously choose to stand in the presence of death. And I'm wondering, how, how did you come to that in your life? I have different answers to that question. Uh, often my answer is, when I was 17 years old, my father died suddenly in a car crash. And that was the first real death uh, that I experienced besides a little turtle in our apartment. And so for me, um, that was very powerful. It was a week before I graduated high school, a very powerful time in my life. And um, I would say that uh, basically uh, widened the crack that had already begun. But it's, it's like that uh, painting you see of the, of the person with their head stuck through the crack of the world, and there's the whole universe. And, and that really began a uh, really big uh, turning in my life. Uh, and has led me to where I am today. But, you know, honestly, uh, I don't know how I ended up. Uh, it, basically, something has grabbed me and so far refuses to let go. As a, as a minister, um, I would say what my calling is, is to wake fully up into the consciousness of who I am and why I'm here and to help everybody else do the same to wake up to who we really are and what, and what our purpose is for being here. And as it turns out, um, see, my work is really at least threefold. One, um, let's start there. Uh, what I have found is a close encounter with death, which in my world is you get a phone call that your friend just suddenly died or your father just suddenly died, or you've got the results of a diagnosis that are, uh, is life-threatening or your friend or relative has, uh, or you drive past a car crash and you, and you look and, and of course we're all pretty much drawn to it, but then it's a car, it turns out we recognize that who that car is. Or you go to a funeral and maybe we're with 100 or 200 people and maybe we don't know them all, but we're drawn together because we know that person. And, and we may all be experiencing a close encounter with death uh, both personally and now collectively. And what I have seen in those experiences is that nothing seems to shift us quite as abruptly and swiftly and deeply as getting that kind of news. That's a close encounter with death. Then it's not a concept or a belief. Uh, then all of a sudden, even though we hear about thousands of people dying in the world every day, and certainly today we're hearing about people dying in flooding in Texas, uh, it doesn't seem to touch us. Uh, it certainly touches us, but certainly we've become jaded to it, maybe because we're overwhelmed by the intensity of how much death is going on all over the world all the time. Uh, and maybe we're such sensitive beings that we've had to protect ourselves from all of that information. And yet when one person close to us dies, something happens, something breaks through that that shifts us in what I would call a very powerful and often very deeply spiritual experience. Uh, that uh, I've been to many spiritual uh, workshops. I've led many. Uh, I, I, I work with a lot of people on a lot of levels. And uh, this death piece seems a close encounter with death. Again, the uh, breaking through to that fragility that it's in the room, it's here with us. And of course, it always is. Uh, but that breakthrough it's a powerful transformational experience that can change people's lives and often do. So that's one level that I work on. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm putting on a four, four night event called uh, the death and dying of, of us and all we love. And it's about the, the, what you described, the fact that the world may be dying. And it's all, it's all part of it. It's all how we show up in our daily lives. So the second level is looking around, uh, having been drawn into this work of hospice and now um, as a funeral director 
running Hawaii's only nonprofit funeral home, uh, seeing how people are dying, and then seeing how people are dying in this country, and our relationship to what it means to die at this time and what our fears are. In fact, really, nobody really wants to die. Everybody wants to be dead, but nobody actually wants to do the dying part. So that's the whole area in terms of our, you know, our ver aversion to uh, our belief in what dying is, because we equate dying with suffering, and we don't see any value in suffering. I don't agree with that. We don't see any value in dying. So that's another uh, place that I work in. And the third place is how we care for the dying and the dead. And I see that over and over again, and, and that was the whole movement nationally, at least, to greenify uh, uh, how we, um, our, last, our last carbon footprint, really. And that's a beautiful thing, and it's an essential piece that also helps draw people into now having conversations about death itself, and that's the Death Cafe movement. And then we've been doing something similar to that for 10 years, so being with dying, a once a month group. Uh, but as far as how we care for the dying, um, we have to take it way beyond dying as a medical and psychological event, which is mostly how it's treated. And there's a whole vastness that's so much bigger than the medical piece and the psychological piece. So I, train, I do trainings now because I see that in order to touch that piece, that wide spectrum that I'm not going to, I could call the mystery right now, um, people need to be on the path themselves of waking up. And what I've discovered is that no matter what you do in the world, uh, it doesn't matter if you're a carpenter or, a, you know, whatever it is, a plumber or a, it doesn't matter, a housekeeper et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that the more awake you are and the more conscious of who you are and why you're here on earth and your connection with all of creation, the more effective you are in all of those, however you show up in the world. And that's most important or certainly up there in importance in terms of how we show up for dying people. And I'd love to unpack, so you've just shared so much, and I'd love to unpack some of it. I'm, I'm just thinking about the, um, I, I had a, my sister died unexpectedly when she was 40, and I remember having an assumption at, this, at the time, oh, it's going to be much easier for me because I'm spiritual and I have this perspective about death. And that was so arrogant and so wrong. <laughs> so it ended up being probably the most traumatic for me of anyone in my family. And later I went to a workshop on death and dying and they talked about how people who have a spiritual framework often feel uh, even more um, broadsided or um, I, I'm trying to think of the right word, betrayed. They feel even more betrayed by death. And so that was a real learning for me. And also it brought up everything I thought I knew and believed about spirit, about creator, about what death and dying was. I, I realized just all of those assumptions went poof, they just vanished. And I'm wondering if you can speak to, I'm assuming that's a pretty common experience for people who are close to someone who dies. Do you, do you find commonalities about what, what people experience when they're close to someone who passes? Is there any commonality? I think there is, and it's a, it's a very wide spectrum. At first, I would say the same thing happened to me, and I, and I, and I counsel dying people, and I counsel their families, uh, and, I, and I counsel grieving people. And uh, I wasn't prepared when I needed to have uh, a tumor taken out of that was attached to my spinal cord. Um, so I had a very similar experience that you did. And again, thinking that um, I have some experience in that world, it shouldn't be that big of a deal and it was a very big deal. Uh, another part of what you uh, spoke to, uh, it was really um, shocking to me, surprising to me that in general for the most part, and I work with a lot of different spiritual communities and I'm in the spiritual community in the Sufi lineage, uh, that the avoidance, aversion and denial is just as thick as everywhere else. Again, that's a generalized statement, but it's most often true. And, uh, and it's often couched in spiritual language uh, and spiritual bypass 
but but really it's the same i i run into people that uh all of a sudden i find out uh, they're about to die or they died and they didn't tell anybody because they were so ashamed and embarrassed um uh to they must have failed they weren't positive enough again in those spiritual uh, terms uh, so often we get caught in and uh, but also too i understand some people don't want to be seen as a dying person uh, by their community so again there's a lot to that piece but uh, i was quite shocked again when uh, i had friends die that i didn't even know were sick or dying because they didn't want anyone to know that was very sad to me Right. I'm, I'm thinking about, she was a dear friend. Um, when I very first started medical school, an incredible photographer, and she was diagnosed with multiple myeloma bone cancer. And she was lived in a very affluent suburb of Cincinnati, Ohio, and went to a party with her husband. And someone said to her, how are you doing, Priscilla? How, how are you feeling? And she looked at them and she told them the truth. She said, I just found out I have bone cancer and they don't think I have long to live. And she said, even though she's talking to one person, she said the entire room went silent and nobody knew what to say. I, I've, what you were saying before about death being something that's pushed aside in our culture, I think we have, we've medicalized it. Death is something that happens in a nursing home or in a hospital. It doesn't happen so much in the living room anymore. And so that we don't have the same vernacular we don't have the same daily experience to share about dying and to me though your work and i think something that um the entire generation the boomer generation has done is every time there's a new part of the life cycle that's visited by that generation they bring it up for discussion like sex and childbirth was brought up for discussion and then it was menopause and andropause. Now it's this whole process of becoming an elder and dying. All of it's being brought up to be discussed, like open up the closet, let's look in here. <laughs> and, and to me that's extraordinary because the, to be able and willing to die fully means then we also end up living fully. And I'm wondering if you can speak some to that. What do you see with people who squarely face their death instead of their friends dying and you didn't even know they were ill? What do you see happening for people who are able and willing to actually engage in the process of dying? Uh, I'll come back to that because you spoke to a few things that I want to uh, touch on. As far as the boomers, um, I don't think the boomers ever really, and I'm one of them, I don't think we ever thought we were going to get old and actually die. Um, <laughs> uh, the interesting thing about the boomer generation, and this is part of the answer to your question, is uh, uh, maybe many of you know this, uh, before the end of the war in America, there were pro approximately 1,600 babies born every day. And the um, army came home, and, and more or less in a year, it went from 1,600 babies a day to 10,000 babies a day. That is what's called the boomer generation, and it went on for, I don't know, 10 years or something, or 15 years. And of course, now a lot of those boomers are watching their parents die and watching their friends die. And that's the, all of a sudden it's like, okay, here, it's really gonna happen. We're really getting old and we're gonna die. And, and so yes, the baby boomers have taught everything, organic gardening and health foods and uh, on and on and on and on and on and, uh, and yay for us. And um, I'll never put down the word hippie because uh, the hippies are part of that whole movement uh, back back to uh, back to sanity and unity and 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 the sacred. Um, as far as when I started, I I was trained as a hospice volunteer and started to be sent into homes to sit with dying people. That was really the beginning of for me schooling in seeing how do people relate to dying, how do people die. And what I saw in general was people were backing into their death, avoiding it completely, uh, uh, ignoring it, uh, often hearing the a phrase that's common now, I'm going to live as normal a life as possible even though I'm dying, which to me is a total oxymoron. Um, it's a bizarre concept, I think. Uh, so mostly I saw people that weren't willing to engage in dying as, an, as something that we actually engage in and do. 
not a passive thing. As uh, uh, one of my teachers, Stephen Jenkinson, has said, it's not a passive thing. Dying is an active verb. And I didn't see hardly anybody, hardly at all, engage in walking towards their dying in a conscious way and willing to do the work and often hard work of completing your life and dying. That's why the pill, you know, we could have, I do a whole teaching on the, this right to die thing and death with dignity and uh, ending your life with a pill. And it's why it's, gonna, it's catching on because again, nobody wants to really be dying. Nobody wants to suffer. And of course, so many of us have been raised to take a pill for everything and anything. And that's a vast conversation. So, uh, you know, somebody, people used to come to me and say, my aunt's dying and she's totally in aversion. So what should I do? Give me some strategies for dealing with my aunt. And I used to, I used to offer them strategies for uh, cracking into that aversion. I don't do that anymore. It's like, I want to meet people where they are. Uh, and be able to love them fully, because I know there's a part of them, there's a part of their consciousness that is completely aware that they're in aversion, and completely aware of whether I'm sitting there in judgment, uh, or resistance to their aversion, or anger, or whatever. And if that part of them recognizes that I'm loving them, it often creates the opening for something else to uh, make, make the conversation a little bit wider, and uh, that, to me, it seems like the strategy that's working the best. So uh, that's you know, when family members uh, counsel with me, um, my best skill, I think, is really to be able to listen deeply uh, and to be able to not have resistance and judgment, rather to respond with love and compassion and to maybe hear a good question to ask. I'm not in the fix-it business or change-it business, uh, oftentimes, dying people feel like they're not good and they're not doing it good enough. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's our uh, uh, wound for many, many people in our culture. I'm not good enough. I'll never get it right, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, again, this is a vast subject. Do you know, I'm thinking about a, a patient I worked with. She, I, I loved her dearly, and I worked with her for two or three years. She first had breast cancer, and then later she had pancreatic cancer. And I remember her saying it was about three months before she died. She called all of her nephews and nieces and her um, sisters to visit her and be with her to say goodbye to them. And she felt so bad. She was certain that she would be dying soon. And she lived another three months. And I remember about a month before she passed, she looked at me and she, she put her hand on, me, on my knee and she said, I never thought it would be this hard. And I think there's a, um, we're not really, um, I don't think most of us have any training. It's not that there is uh, a one size fits all definition of what it is to die, but I think there are some stages. Just like we know now there are stages of birthing, there are stages of dying. And I wonder if we knew more as a culture about those stages, if we could relax into them more, if we understood more the stages. I'm wondering if you've seen that in your work. Is there any? ease that people develop when they have some understanding of, of the death process. You know, this is kind of connected to this whole um, idea of conscious dying. And with conscious dying is almost a, a kind of a sexy term uh, in some ways. And uh, I used to think that people were talking about, let's say, the last two days or the last month. Uh, or the, you know, and it's clear to me that uh, without conscious living, uh, conscious dying is a very difficult, very challenging thing. Uh, it's like uh, uh, cramming for the test, uh, the, uh, the morning of the test. Uh, the difference is you may be in tremendous pain and, and suffering, and you may be um, numbed out by opiates. Uh, it's a very difficult time to go to the sudden school and uh, have a conscious dying experience. In fact, uh, it, it really points to me that uh, because I see what people work on when they're dying and, there's a, and, and see, self, in my view, Judgment Day is Self-Judgment Day. And that's, we're, sitting, we're going through our whole lives and, you know, did, did, you know did, we, did we live a life of value? You know, did we sit at a desk making widgets for, you know, that ended up in the dump? Um, how did we spend our lives? Did we add value in any way to our community? 
uh, did we live beyond our own um, our own self, separate self? Uh, there's a tremendous amount of work that wants to be done. All of us leave trails behind us and are constantly leaving trails. And those trails are either covered in love and respect and appreciation and, and friendship and community, or there are spots of anger and resentment and unresolved relationships uh, and messes we've made that are still out there. Uh, uh, for a while, I owed somebody a hundred bucks and they'd forgotten about it a long time ago, but it still was there for me until I could clear that up and knew I needed to because I don't want to be on my deathbed thinking about that hundred bucks nobody else is thinking about. But that's what I see in watching people die. And then there's the other piece again, uh, is there something inside of us that's going to show up for us that somehow is going to be uh, that source of refuge or strength to a stand in the midst of dying. And again, uh, did we develop something in our lifetime that was bigger than, you know, I mean mine, uh, that, that showed up and shows up when we get sick and when we're dying. And, uh, and just like you, I had a, a, a you know, a powerful self-reflection on that when I had back surgery in terms of how much something showed up for me. And, uh, and the, the, one of the neat parts of that story is uh, the surgeon came in after the surgery and said he was surprised that uh, it went as well and as easy as it did. Uh, and he told me what he thought was the reason for it. And I told him that I thought the real reason for it was I knew that 2,000 people in my spiritual community were praying for me. And I have seen it over and over again how much it means for people to feel that other people are praying for them. So again, um, there's so much to the conversation about what you're speaking to. Right, and th thank you for bringing forward that it's the, the way we live that has a huge impact on the quality of our dying. You know, that, like you said, it's not what just right, right what happens at the end, it's a continuum of the way we've lived our life then bleeds into the way we go through our dying process. So that's a really profound insight. Conscious, conscious. Right. I'm sorry, conscious living is that we do that work now in terms of cleaning up the trail behind us uh, so that we're fresh, present, uh, and not having this unresolved, unfinished business. Not that we won't make more as we go along. I, you know, every day I say I'm sorry for something. Um, uh, but And the other piece of that work, uh, is it important to us to cultivate um, community service? So that we feel like we have uh, given more than we've taken and actually I don't think there's any way we'll be able to give back all that's being given to us and has been given to us. Uh, I feel incredibly indebted uh, uh, and, and, and have dedicated my life in service hoping I can uh, at least make a dent in how much is constantly uh, being given to me and has been given to me. And two, uh, is there something inside of me that's going to help me uh, navigate and stay clear in again who I am and why I'm here and where I'm going because when I know who I am I know where I'm going and I'm relaxed about it in fact I rejoice because uh, death is part of the miracle too and and again there is no death there is and there isn't and the, and the dance of those two pieces that's the work of, of I know it's, I know deep in my body that there is death. I see it, I'm around it. Uh, uh, there is no death. I see that, but I don't in, totally embody that completely in every breath that I take in my life. I'm, and that's the work for me, to recognize that there is no death in the midst of there is death. That's a profound statement. I'll sit with that for a moment. This is, this is not exactly the same, but I'm thinking about how many people um, have maybe misunderstood the Tibetan, like the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying or the Tibetan Book of the Dead as being obsessed with death. Like here's a culture obsessed with death. And it, I can't remember who it, who it was, that, whose writing or teaching it was that they helped me to see that Facing death squarely and cleaning up things, like you've said, then opens the door to live fully. It's 
it's like if if I'm constantly living with this unexplored thing on my shoulder, it can really unconsciously run me. But if I really work with death and I'm at peace with it, then I can get on with living fully. So that any moment I could lift off and be happy with that exit, happy with that exit from the earth. And so I, I hear that and what you're describing and that the other piece that really strikes me is you just touched on it, the importance of community and the, commu the community prayer and the community support and what an extraordinary piece that is for you to be here and to be healthy after that surgery. Um, but also, so it's it's important in the living, but it's also important in our liftoff and <laughs> our exit. Can you say more about that? How can we come together more as a community to be in support of people and their dying process? Well, the most direct answer I could give to that is uh, having the realization that my life doesn't in fact belong to me that my life belongs to all, uh, the community of life itself. Um, and in fact, when p I counsel with people that um, for, uh, want to know about in, how to end their life and want to counsel with me about ending their life, and um, I, don't have a, I don't have a strong judgment about it either way because uh, sometimes it looks quite appropriate and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so I do want to add that piece to the conversation. I, I get where I get where the person is at. I do, and I and I can connect to their heart and what's what's bringing forth this inquiry. And I try to stretch the conversation out by saying, what if what if it's true that your life doesn't belong to you? And it doesn't. It doesn't. And in fact, your dying and your death don't really belong to you either. Uh, in fact, when I ask groups of people, how many of you have been touched at one point, at least one time in your life, by somebody close to you dying? Just about everybody raises their hand. Everybody has been changed in some way by someone else's death. So, again, you know, it points to our death isn't all about us, which, is, of course, is a, a radical concept in a country that says it's all about me. Yes. You know, uh, this whole notion about the, even the words death, uh, dead, and die have pretty much become taboo words that are uh, slowly starting to uh, come out. I mean, I, I'm standing here holding the flag, I think, on pr pretty much the extreme end of the conversation. But we have a store called the Death Store. And uh, about a hundred of my friends have said to me, I love what you're doing, but you can't call it the Death Store. And um, I'm like, uh, uh, okay. And, you know, what, what is the newspaper? I mean, I read the obituaries in the newspaper every week on my radio show, and nobody dies, everybody passes away. And, of course, we have a number of euphemisms that they pass away, or they transition, or they graduate, or their wedding ceremony, or a change of address, et cetera, et cetera. Hardly anybody dies. You, you know, we hear that the dog died, and the tree died, and the car died, but we hardly ever hear that grandma died. And that's, again, in the aversion and avoidance and denial that we've turned those, those words are just about taboo words. And, you know, people say to me, how can you do that work? It's so morbid. Isn't it so depressing? And it comes back to what you said about obsessed. Um, no, I'm more enlivened by it. And uh, it's, every day it's making my life richer. Uh, one, I don't procrastinate anymore. I don't assume I have lots of time. That's our assumption. Uh, it's the elephant in the room. We assume we have lots of time, that our children have lots of time, that our friends have lots of time, that the world has lots of time. And uh, I don't assume that that's true anymore, so I don't procrastinate. What's really rich for me is that I don't know when the last time I'm going to see somebody is anymore. That's more real in my life now. Uh, and I've had a few lousy experiences about, gee, I'm really sorry that was the last talk that we had or that was the last time I saw that person, et cetera, et cetera. And so my, my having more awareness around that piece, I'm so much more present with when I'm in, when I'm speaking with somebody, when I'm in front of somebody. It's funny, I had this um, time where I was so much in that awareness and it was kind of a new awareness at that time. I have a bunch of kids and at the time they were teenagers and every time they'd say, okay, dad, I'm going off to the beach. Okay, I'm going surfing, going out with my friends. 
I would grab them and squeeze them as hard as I could. I love you so much. I love you. I want you to know I love you. And I'm sorry for everything. I'm a lousy parent. I, you know, you know, that lasted about uh, maybe two weeks. And my kids were like, could you just leave us alone? We're just going out for the night. And uh, yeah, I had to leave them alone and just kind of like, but still, uh, you know, you know, and you know, when we talk about how it makes an awareness of death and brings our lifetime, uh, you know, people say to me, what do you think about life after death? And, my work, uh, to tell you the truth, is about is there life before death? Mm. Uh, and it comes back to your question initially about uh, elders and uh, wisdom and, um, you know, or there's too many children in old bodies uh, and for, for many reasons. And um, there are too many unlived lives. And that's where a tremendous amount of suffering happens when people are dying. And wait a minute, I can't be dying now. I never got to live my life or the life I wanted to live or... The thing I really wanted to do, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The unlived life is a, a tremendous cause of suffering. Do you know, I'm I'm thinking about the um, what you described about your sons. I have a similar thing. I worked in a nursing home for about a year before I went to medical school, and I during that period of time, and also later when I worked with cancer patients, I was so acutely aware of this might be the last time I see someone, and it's. In a, in a certain way, a much more vulnerable place to live. The, the vulnerability of knowing that someone may um, exit at any moment, uh, but also much richer. I've known people who do have that awareness of dying, who live so richly every day. I remember walking into an intensive care unit, and there was a patient I'd worked with off and on um, over a couple of years, and here he is in intensive care, and he grabs my hand, and he has this huge smile on his face, and he said, tell me how you are today. And he prayed over me. He's praying over me. <laughs> it was just such an extraordinary experience of how he was really clear on what was important to him. And to me, if there's any hidden blessing, I would never wish on someone to have cancer or a major um, life-threatening disease. But on the other hand, people get really clear about what's important to them. And they, they put that right front and center in their lives. And, and that, that to me is extraordinary to see when people get really clear on what's important to them. I'm, I'm wondering in your work, if you have developed heroes or role models for your work, if you've discovered role models for what you're doing. Well, uh, there's, there's an archetype that has really um, resonated in my being um, for a good 40, at least 40 years. And that archetype has shown up as Jesus. And it has shown up as Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, it, it has shown up as Crazy Horse. And I have a very strong um, past life uh, memory I don't know if it was my past life, but a very strong memory of uh, being in that Native American life and running with Crazy Horse and have a very deep connection of who he was. And he was a very peace making. Uh, he was in the archetype of Gandhi and Jesus. And um, but that's the archetype that comes through the strongest for me uh, in those three uh, beings. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I see, you know, some of my heroes are the, the people I see who are willing to uh, stay awake while they're dying and to embrace dying as uh, part of the miracle and, and, and not necessarily not be afraid, but to not let that fear uh, get in the way of eyes wide open and heart wide open. Uh, because, um, again, when your life doesn't belong to you, um, you can help all of us uh, by dying face forward uh, with an open eyes and an open heart. And as you said earlier, since a death has basically been, uh, for the most part, removed from us by hospitals, funeral homes, and uh, care institutions, uh, we don't, we're not around it enough to learn what it means to die and how to do it. Mm -hmm. so how do we learn how to die? Will we be around people that are engaged in dying as a um, as a gift? You know, I say it's the experience of a lifetime. 
Um, so, um, so heroes, uh, that I see, you know, people that open their, uh, you know, um, sometimes something so traumatic happens to someone. And of course, most of us have had our heart broken more than once, maybe many times. And I see that there are two strategies. And one is that people, some people want to armor themselves so they can never be that hurt ever again. And that armoring keeps them from being hurt. And, uh, but it also keeps their own love from coming out, uh, from expressing their love. And those people I see turn into bitter old people with very few friends. And then I see someone who's had the most traumatic experience uh, let's say uh, their young daughter dies suddenly, uh, for example, as maybe one of the hardest things there is. And, and I've seen a few of these people get into bed and never want to get out of bed and hope that they die. Pray that they die and pray that they could change places with their daughter. And I'm getting chicken skin while I'm telling you this. And then I've seen some of those people get out of bed and somehow, I don't know how they do it, their heart has somehow gotten bigger in that crack. And they then, I, I've seen a few people now, go out and engage in the community to support people in similar situations. Mm. And I am just, these are my heroes. How did they do that? How could they have come out of that in a bigger, bigger life? Those are my heroes. It's interesting. So it it's part of what I hear you saying is that the that crack, that opening that death brings is has the opportunity to be like the Christmas Carol, like Ebenezer Scrooge waking up and and coming coming into being a completely different person. I mean the truth is we all have that potential every day. But it's from what I hear you saying, death brings us right up against that, right up against that possibility has that opportunity. You know, um, this, this uh, we're going to die and we don't know when is a giant piece of information. And to live in that truth, and not just as a knowing, but as a realization and an embodiment, is a very razor's edge. You know, how do you live in the world knowing that at any moment you can die and that everyone you know and love and everyone else can die? And in a sense, uh, where some, that's where that, some of that low-level anxiety comes in about uh, what's happening in the world, both environmentally and politically and, you know, globally. You know, how to live with that, it's, almost, it's, it's pretty intense to live on that razor's edge. So how do we live uh, in, in joy and dance and love and plant trees for my grandchildren and be able to plan uh, next week and next month and next year? but not, not turn away from the truth that we're going to die and we don't know when, the impermanence of it all. And that is the razor's edge to walk. And it's not an easy path, and I don't, I don't find it easy. I fall into that, oh, yeah, we have time. And, uh, you know, because it's such a razor's edge, and, and yet, like you said, I meet people who come to me and say, wow, I had tumors on my brain and was about to die, and I never felt so alive in my life. And then they come back to me six or eight months later and say, I lost, I lost that feeling. Uh, you know, again, I fall back into, I have plenty of time. And so then again, how do we, how do we come into full, vibrant, totally passionate, on purpose living without having to be dying to experience that? I'm wondering if you can share also, you've touched on this, but we didn't, visit it deeply. What is the wisdom that elders carry and what is the importance of having elders in our society and our culture? You know, again, that's a, that's a big conversation. That there are, in my view, there aren't that many elders, that period. Uh, you don't automatically become an elder by getting old. You know, the, uh, in our culture, it, uh, we've turned into the elderly. And the elderly, uh, to a large degree, have been push, pushed off the table of relevance. And incompetence uh, is, a, is a term you hear more and more and more about old people. Uh, and, and of course, what does that speak to? It speaks to that old people 
aren't considered to be competent in the skills that a culture deems most important. Not the skills that old people themselves may have garnered and learned becoming old people. And so there are many wounded old people uh, feeling valueless. Uh, you know, why am I still alive? What, what's the, you know, uh, basically I'm invisible in the culture, especially older women are become super invisible in the culture. Uh, and, and often uh, old people are portrayed as kind of a stupid, silly uh, idiots on television sitcoms. Uh, mm. You know, on and on and on. There's so much cultural conditioning about it. Uh, but, you know, but true elders, uh, it, you know, you know. Again, this comes back to there's no real initiation in our culture, and uh, much to my detriment, which is why there are so many children in old people's bodies, uh, many of them running the world. And uh, without an initiation, um, I think only some kind of close encounter and experience with death itself, which most initiatory experiences in other cultures often included a, an experience with death. And without that, uh, and it seems to me the people I see who are either elders or elders in training have been shook to their core by a death experience. So then uh, what is wisdom? I would say it's not this experience combined with time and deep insight, deep insight into that experience, which is about a lot of self-reflection again caused probably by a death experience somewhere which somehow brings a whole different perspective into everything that's what happened to me when my father died everything was different just like the first time uh, i became a grandfather i was there at my daughter's birth and mm -hmm. i looked different in the mirror immediately and felt different and do feel different and two both of my parents have died and so now i'm the last generation in that blood lineage and that is adds a difference to it so it's not just those experiences but the insight and deep re self-reflection and community reflection because you spoke a little while ago about the importance of community in an initiatory experience the third critical piece of an initiation is coming back to your community and letting your people reflect with you what they see and helping you interpret what happens for you. So again, that's, that's a piece of what you've spoken to. Yeah, I, I think also I, something, part of my work has been encouraging women going through menopause to create rites of passage and women going through adolescence to create rites of passage. And I think of those, that third part, not only reflecting back to that person, but also helping the community to be ready to accept that person as being different. You know, when, when we lived in really tight, close cultures, I think it was harder for people to transform because the community vessel was potentially holding them in the same way. So that that initiatory right is not only for the individual, but also for the community to welcome them in a new way, that they're new, they're, they're, that they are different. They are a different person. Hmm. The nature of love, the nature of love and compassion is about its movement in community. It doesn't happen alone. And I would say that's true with the spirit. Any spiritual realization or embodiment isn't fully real until it meets the street. In fact, Rhonda said years ago, if you want to know how spiritually evolved you are, spend time with your parents. <laughs> and uh, that's true. That's as true statement as there is. And, uh, uh, but the, the embodiment of spiritual realization is, is again in movement, in activity, in community, in my view. Yes. That... Maybe, maybe I did have a lifetime in a cave in India, um, but that's clearly not the um, ray or the path that uh, I came in on. Right. There, there's a book title, and I'm not going to get it exactly right, but it's something to the effect of, Buddha didn't drive day, uh, carpool, and and Jesus didn't do daycare. You know, like they, there's there's something extraordinarily authentic about having to bring whatever our spiritual realizations are into our daily lives. That's where the rubber hits the road, right? That's, 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 I, 
that's funny. That's very funny. Uh, I was teaching um, last month, and I said something, and uh, somebody in the group said, well, here's what this spiritual teacher said about that. And that's exactly what I said. This spiritual teacher doesn't deal with money, doesn't deal with rent, doesn't have kids, doesn't have family, doesn't have, you know, business, doesn't take care of their car, on and on and on. I mean, it's like the Zorba the Greek calls it the, you know, the great catastrophe of, again, engaging um, in the world. And it may, it may not be for everyone, but um, it sure is the way I'm on. Beautiful. Are there any, this time has flown by. I'm wondering, uh, do you have any um, final bits of light or guidance for people who are really in that place of ripeness, readiness to bring that awareness of death into their lives? You know, again, I come back to um, that the most effective way we can function and serve in any capacity, in any role, in any job, is how awake we are. It's how awake we are. And that means uh, coming into the truth of who we really are on a very deep level. And, and that leads us to purpose. Um, actually, actually, what you love uh, will help lead you to purpose. In fact, when I counsel with young people, I say, find out what it is you really love and see where that meets the world and go for it. And uh, that may not be it. And maybe you're going to fall down. You just get up. I fall down and get up. Fall down and get up. And I tell my kids, you can't succeed if you're not willing to fail. But again, I think uh, for me, uh, at the core, this spiritual transformation that we have to wake up. Uh, in fact, Joanna Macy talks a lot about the great turning that there are three responses to, and, and so does Charles Eisenstein, uh, in terms of. Uh, what are we doing in the face of what's happening in the world? And some of us are on the front lines of stopping those trains of plutonium, and uh, some of those are, you know, showing up and protesting, and, uh, you know, Sea Shepherd and Greenpeace, and uh, on and on and on and on, all, all the organizations and people who are saying stop the madness and getting in the way of the madness and doing everything they can to stop the madness. That's one strategy. The second strategy is all these, all the new paradigms of what's regenerative, regenerative, you know, organic art, agriculture, sustainable farming, a new schools, uh, new prisons, uh, on and on and on and on. The whole new paradigms and uh, you know, conscious dying, uh, the greening of dying, uh, you name it. You know, home birthing, all, all of the, all of the new paradigms, alternative uh, medicine. You know, again, stuff that uh, cleans and regenerates and connects to all of creation and is part of the healing and the, and the creativity and the life. That's the second strategy. And the third piece is changing human consciousness. And it won't matter if we're all composting and recycling and driving around in electric cars if we're still experiencing separateness. Separateness from each other, separateness from the rest of the web of life. And we are not separate from the rest of the web of life. And it's coming home to haunt us now because we, are just, we have been destroying the world. And now it's going to come back. It is coming back on us. We're seeing it all the time. And many of us in the 60s and 70s saw it coming if we kept going on that train of what we thought was progress. And unfortunately, that train has continued forward. And the, uh, it looks pretty dire out there from certain views. Very dire. So that's it. Wake up, uh, wake up, and show up in life, and uh, and find ways to serve. And there are millions of ways to serve. They're everywhere you look. You know, uh, contribute, serve, wake up. That you know, that's what I'm working on in my life. So uh, that's all I can offer, really. Beautiful. And I loved what you said earlier about th that your life is not your own. So give it as a gift. You know, give it, give it away as a gift. Um, and that's what I hear you saying in the service. What wonderful, what wonderful stepping stones to offer for people. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. And I want to remind people that you can continue to, um, to learn from Reverend Bodhi B and to connect with him and his work. And can you say some about how people can stay in connection with you 
Is there a website they can go to yeah, yeah. where they can stay in connection? Our website is uh, doorway into light, L-I-G-H-T dot org. Um, we have a Facebook presence, uh, the death store uh, slash doorway into light. Um, uh, we're opening up a doorway into light ministry of death, a Facebook page. Uh, you can certainly tune into the radio show every Tuesday from 3 to 5 p.m. And Kauai time uh, is streaming uh, on the internet wherever you are in the world. And that address is K A K U dot A K A A K A K U dot org. K A K U dot A K A K U dot org. Uh, that's Maui's community uh, radio and television station. Uh, so it's streaming live every Tuesday and uh, tune in. It's a call-in show. Call in from anywhere in the world. Uh, we have guests that play music and, and themes of death, uh, dying, wisdom, conscious, wholehearted, living and dying. We have a good time. It's a two-hour show. And, uh, I love playing the music, too, because I can drop in some deep places, in my view, and, and then I'll play a, a musical cut just to let us kind of drink in and, and settle and see where to go. So uh, between the website, doorwayandelight.org, uh, the radio show k a k u dot a k a k u dot org. Uh, you can you can email me at bodhi b o d h i at doorway into light dot org. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization here in Hawaii, uh, doing an incredible amount of work, and uh, we're we're all we're supported by your donations, uh, and we do our best to provide uh, uh, ways to support people that don't have money when they're dying and uh, when they're dead. Um, so we're, um, we're supported by your contribution, and uh, there's an easy place on the website to uh, make a contribution. So look below our interview, you'll find the link to Bodhi's website, and also the link to his radio show, so that you'll be able to find those places very easily. And at the very bottom, if you're interested, you can also have lifetime access to this interview and to all of the interviews from the summit. So that's an opportunity also at the very bottom. So thank you so much for being here, for sharing your wisdom with us. It's been an absolute del delight to connect with you. It's been a delight on this side too, and I, I appreciate it, uh, how you held the space and, and uh, the questions uh, you asked. So I thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>